Good morning to our online Bridge family. We're so happy to provide this option for you to still be a part of Sunday mornings at the Bridge. The service will be starting very shortly and we are excited to get to worship and learn from the teaching alongside of you. Now let's be honest. At this point in the morning, most of us have probably gone through a few cups of coffee by now. In the comments section, type out what your go-to coffee order is. No shame if you like to load that thing up with cream and sugar. So go ahead and let us know what your favorite kind of coffee is. If you haven't already, click the share button beneath this video. Sharing the live stream on Facebook is the easiest way to invite your friends to church and help them hear about the bridge. Lastly, I want to encourage you to follow us on our social media. On both Instagram and YouTube, our username is TBCC Warrington, and you can follow us there for more updates about what's going on at the bridge week to week. Thank you again for being part of the Bridge Community Church this week online. We hope that you are filled with hope and receive everything the Lord has for you to experience in this service today. We'll get started very shortly. And I 
can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadow. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. An almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadow. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. An almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in shadows you win every battle nothing can stand against the power of our god no no it can't so when i fight i'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high oh god the battle belongs to you and every fear i'm Turn 
the rest of the Bridge family. If you are in the building, if you are not, reach out to the rest of the online Bridge family. We are going to move on to the rest, but first, let's meet some people, then we're going to keep on going. Welcome, and I'd like to welcome all our first-time attenders and guests. And if you are visiting with us today, we just ask that you will just reach in front of you in the card box and grab the connection card and fill it out, and you can give it to an usher as you leave. It's, it's a way that we will get to know you. And then after you hand it to the usher at the door, please come to the Welcome Center where we have a gift for you and a gift bag that is able to tell you more about the bridge. So let's welcome all our first time attenders and guests. If you are visiting with us or you've been coming to the bridge for quite some time, we offer a connection group called Growth Track. It meets on Sunday afternoons at 3.30 by Zoom. So just email me, Pastor Lisa, at bridgeforlife.com, and then that way I'll send you the Zoom link so that you can join in Growth Track. At this time, I'd like to transfer, though, to um, receiving the offering. And we always like to read a scripture because it's part of worship, how we take the offering and how we give to the Lord. It's part of our worship to Him. And we have different ways for you to give. You can give at the kiosk, out in the lobby, at the door, at the usher, um, with one of the ushers. But also you can give through the mail. So would you read this scripture with me, please? It's Acts 20, verse 35. In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. Remembering the words the Lord Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much for who you are. And Lord, that you give us the opportunity to give back to you a portion of what you give to us. Lord, I pray that you bless our tithes and offerings. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. At this time, turn your attention to the screen for the morning announcements. Uh, this is a flower delivery from yours truly, Pastor Greg. Now you can, too, get your loved one some flowers from the Vertical Student Ministry. Okay, so basically what you're going to do is you're going to sign up in the lobby or email me at Pastor Austin at BridgeForLife.com and we can, too, send flowers to your loved one this Friday. After we deliver those flowers, we have a special night planned. You can do a candlelight dinner. Uh, so it's $60 for the flowers, $60 for the dinner. But you can combine them both for just $100. If you have any questions, just email me. Uh, sign up in the lobby, and we will get you set up. But yeah, turn your attention to the screen for today's announcements now. <laughs> We want to thank you for being with us here this weekend at The Bridge. Whether you're joining us in person or online, we are so glad you're here. Here are this week's announcements. Bridge Church members, two Sundays from now, February 21st, will be our annual church business meeting. The meeting will be held here at the Ministry Center in the sanctuary and start right after the 10.45 a.m. service. We'll see you there. Are you tired of coming up short on Valentine's Day? Well, the Vertical Youth has you covered for the low price of $60. A dozen roses will be delivered to your address of choice on Friday, February 12th. 
And to top this fundraiser off for another $60, there'll be a romantic candlelight dinner here at the Ministry Center for you and your loved ones. But wait, there's more. If you choose to bundle, we'll slash the cost to just $100. That's the rose delivery and the candlelight dinner for just $100. Don't miss this opportunity to help the Vertical Youth raise funds for this year's ministry events. Sign up in the lobby, email me at pastoraustin at bridgeforlife.com to reserve your table and flowers. Men of all ages, 13 and up, you are invited to a breakfast fellowship here at the Ministry Center on Saturday morning, February 20th at 8 a.m. Please come enjoy a hearty country breakfast and a teaching segment from Pastor Greg. You can sign up and bring $5 to the Welcome Center after service. See you there. Ladies, the Bridge Women's Ministry, Ladies on the Move, would like to invite you to attend the Roar 2021 Women's Conference titled Made for This on Friday and Saturday, March 12th and 13th in Richmond, Virginia. The registration fee is $89 per person and hotels run about $120 per room. If you would like time away for encouragement about what God has for your life, please contact me at marygscro at gmail.com if you're interested in going. Hope to see you there. Thank you so much for watching. We are praying for you and your family to have a blessed week ahead. Please enjoy the message. We have some pretty creative people here, don't we? So anyway, it is great to see everybody here today. And as uh, said earlier, because of the uh, questionable weather, uh, we're recording this just as a backup. So if this had to be used on Sunday, greetings. But anyway, we're continuing on in this series called Facing the Giants, and we have already uh, addressed the story over the last four weeks of David and Goliath, and now we're jumping to the book of Numbers, because yes, there is another story that addresses uh, how they had to face the giants of their day. So I'm going to ask you to stand for the reading of, you, of the word, if you would, and we're going to read Numbers chapter 13, and we're going to read verses 26 through 33. Come on, read with me. They came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran. There they reported to them and to the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is its fruit. But the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites live in the Negev. The Hittites and Jebusites and Amorites live in the hill country. And the Canaanites live near the sea and along the Jordan. Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, We should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. But the men who had gone up with him said, We can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. They said, The land we explore devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilim. There the descendants of Anak come from the Nephilim. We seem like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked same to them. Now, Holy Spirit, I pray as we look at the word that you would use it to help us as we face the challenges, the giants in our life. Help us to see that, God, you have always, always had solutions. And I pray that our faith will be elevated and encouraged in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. 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 The Lord bless you. you can be seated. So we're going to continue on in the series, but we're in a different story. And I'm just going to tell you, we'll also continue the story next week, and that'll be the conclusion of this series uh, called Facing the Giants. So today, I'll also just be laying a little bit of the foundation so that we can uh, just continue on in this series next week and wrap it up. But let me kind of give you some background. You probably know this. I love to get into the history of things, and one of the reasons I like history is this. When you understand the historical context of what's being said, it avoid, it, it's a protection from getting into the weeds and distorting things from what was really intended. And if you've ever had somebody who's tried to uh, quote you and they took the sentence out of context, 
it's frustrating, isn't it? You go, yeah, but you took a sentence, and that was put in a paragraph. And if you would put everything that I said before that sentence and afterwards, that would become a lot more clear to you. But you're taking out of context what I said. Right? And so it's the same way. So let me just kind of set this up. Maybe you've never thought of the Bible in a chronological order, so I'm going to give you a little bit because I think it helps. We estimate that the Israelites left Egypt, the Passover where they got delivered. We estimate that was around April 1446 B.C. And now we come to the book of Numbers, this journey from Egypt to where they're at. It's now, they, they are now about 16 months now ahead in the, in the calendar. And so this means this. They are now, it's approximately August 1445 B.C., and they are in position to cross over in the, into that promised land. So it's been a 16-month journey from Egypt to this precipice of where they're at. And let me just tell you, uh, 16 months may not seem like a long time until you've gone through COVID. <laughs> right? And the other part of it is, that's a long time when you consider they were walking through the desert the entire time. That's a, that's a, long, seri that's a long, serious walk. I would challenge you to go on a 16-month hike, okay? So anyway, they're on this precipice, and they're ready to go in. And after scour uh, scouting out the promised land, the Israelites, uh, trusting God, falters because they see giants. As, as a result, God keeps them in the wilderness for another 40 years until another generation is raised up that believes his promises. So this is where they go in, they come out, they hear the report, and they go, yeah, this ain't going to work. And God says, that's it. You think 16 months is long, go for a 40-year hike. And I'm going to get some people who will actually believe what I said to them that they actually believe. So I'll just raise up another generation. And so that's what God does. However, there are two people, Joshua and Caleb, and I'm going to be talking about one of those uh, uh, characters there next week to kind of give this a wrap-up on the story. But uh, two people maintain their trust in God, and he promises, meaning God, that they will live to possess the promised land. Now, isn't that ironic? Because we all know that when they did go into the promised land, it wasn't Moses. It was Joshua, the leader, correct? But there's also the story of Caleb. And we're going to be looking, like I said, at this a little further next week. So let me just kind of uh, describe what the problem was. You, we read this uh, phrase and we heard this term called the Nephilim. Now, I promise you that's not a word that you hear on Main Street or where you work. I promise you that's probably never come up around the dinner table. And so the word Nephilim actually means giants or tall people. Okay, that's the actual, what the word actually means. We also heard this uh, phrase called, they come from a knock. Okay, and it's important to understand, they said descendants of a knock. This is, this, that was the tribe of giant people. So everybody understand that? A knock is the tribe? Come on, let's act like you're getting it, right? Okay? And the Philem are the members of that tribe, the descendants of that tribe. Okay, And so there are these giants. And by the way, that's where Goliath and his brothers and some of the others in the, in the Philistines who were, were large people, that's where they came from. But anyway, so as we get into this a little further, the reason the Bible mentions this is this. Because giants, their greatest weapon of a, the greatest weapon that a giant has is fear. Just fear. By being there in size and looking down on you, the giant is counting on a spirit of fear, a spirit of intimidation. That even before there's any type of conflict, that you already start to feel this is not going to go well. And it worked with the Israelites on the story we looked at with David and Goliath. He's out there 40 days, 40 nights. Okay, And we don't read that anybody had ever seen Goliath in battle. But they had to assume by the fact that he was the way he was dressed and the fact that he was and that the Philistine nation had such confidence and sent him out there, they're just like, man, I who do we go to send? Who are we going to send? And so obviously David is the one who goes out. So here's this. We're going to be looking at this context of fear tonight. And then we're going to be looking at it from a different angle, uh, from our more of a deliberate, uh, what I would say, expression of faith next week. So tonight, we're going to be looking at this context of fear. Why is this important? Because this story is loaded with fear. 
And fear has a debilitating effect on every dimension of our life. Fear just doesn't affect one dimension. Fear is like a cancer. It just has a way of sucking the life out of everything. And it paralyzes you. And now let me just say this. There are some times we should be fearful. Right? You come home and your front door is ajar. And there's splinters where the bolt, deadbolt used to be. You know, I wouldn't tell you just to walk in, act like nothing's wrong there. How many know it would pay to have a little fear and a little caution and a little good judgment? Okay? So I'm not going to say that. But we just have to recognize what unhealthy fear can do to us and how it paralyzes and can debilitate us. And we're going to look at it in the story. So, point number one. Everybody read it out loud. Come on, read it. Fear changes our perception of reality and God's activity. Another way of saying this is this. Fear messes with your brain, and when you mess with a person's brain, you mess with what they see. Now notice this. We're going to look at this. Numbers chapter 13, verses 26 through 20. And by the way, these people have been crying out for 400 years, God, get us out of Egypt. God takes them in 16 months to the, right, to the precipice of everything they've ever heard and ever wanted, and they're there, and watch what happens. They came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran. There they reported to them and to the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the lamb, or the land. Do you see that? So they actually brought the evidence to back up the stories that they've been told. It says, they gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Notice the exclamation point. So they're, right now, they're in testimony mode. Right? If you put an exclamation, that's not a conversation, that's a yell, right? Here it is. Here is the fruit. But the people who, how many know, anytime you start a conversation and then you go, but... You know that there's a pivot coming that is not consistent with whatever you have just heard up to that point. It's like a kid. Did you mow the grass? Yes, but how many already know? That means they didn't do it. All right, here we go. But the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very large. Look at this. We even saw descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites live in the Negev, the Hittites, the Jebusites. By the way, the Jebusites were the ones who controlled Jerusalem. And they didn't get control of Jerusalem until David became king. I'd mentioned that before. And they were phenomenal warriors. They were not lightweights. Okay? And the Amorites live in the hill country. And the Canaanites live near the sea and along the Jordan. But, and then it goes on in verse 31, but the men who had gone up with him said, meaning talking about Caleb, we can't attack those people, they're stronger than we are. So they acknowledge their, what is there is what they had heard, and now they find the reasoning why not to do it. Now, let's just rehearse this. So what are you going to do after 16 months? And you decide you're not going to complete the journey. We're going to get into that in a little bit. But you're kind of like, and what, what, what is plan B? Plan A all along has been, we're going. So now you guys are saying we're not going. Plan B is what? Uh -huh. That's what I'm talking about. Fear has a way of making nowhere the vision. But actually they did have a plan, and I'm going to show you that in a little bit. It's in chapter 14. But I think it was more of a last-ditch effort because they, I think they may have dug themselves a hole. And they had to hurry up and come up with, where. so if we're not going this way, where are we going? Because we estimate that there was at least 2 to 3 million people. Okay? That's not, oh, we went down the wrong cul-de-sac, let's turn around. <laughs> two to, we estimate 2 to 3 million people. You just don't go, oh, gee, we took a wrong turn. You know, we got to... That, that takes a lot of effort to say and to coordinate, here's where we're going and here's, where, here's how we're doing it, okay? So fear has a way of messing with our reality and even God's activity. They acknowledge that what God had said was true, but fear caused them to doubt something that God confirmed to them. Get it? God confirmed it, right? 
and they doubt it. What causes a person to go, yeah, God came through, but fear? Fear will cause you to start seeing and believing things about God that not intended. So let's look at this a little further. I'm going to unpack this. I got three, I got three points under point one. This is a preacher's dream right now. <laughs> so let's look at this fear a little bit, the, how it distorts and it messes with our reality and it, our understanding of reality and how it messes with God's activity. First of all, it begins this way. Fear facilitates loose talk. You start embellishing. You start getting into the fringes and the grayer. Look at it in chapter, or chapter 13, verses 32 through 33. So they've already told Moses the report. They've already given the report, right? So, okay, is that good enough? No. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. Now, wait a minute. You all said, and you brought evidence that this is good. And that it was flowing with milk and honey. And I remember, when we wrote it out, we put an exclamation point because you were excited. <laughs> So he goes on to say, a bad report about the land. They said, the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there of great size. We saw the Nephilim there, the descendants of Anak come from the Nephilim. Now notice this, loose talk. We seem like grasshoppers in our own eyes. Whoa! Notice how fear will change your self-image. Fear will make you feel insecure. Fear will cause you to shut down the blessings of who you are and what you have and the resource and the abilities. Fear will talk you out of yourself. We seem like grasshoppers in our own eyes. And we look the same to them. Wow. Fear had caused them to see themselves in a way that they thought, no, they thought the giants seen them. Loose talk. You know, getting into the fringes, getting into the weeds. Not significant embellishment, but there's a little bit of embellishment because you just feel like you need to make your case stronger. And after all, who's going to actually walk into the land to confirm the story that they just told? So, you know, they kind of have the ability to be a little embellishing and not have to worry about anybody checking the facts out. So loose talk contributes to fear. The second thing is, fear facilitates loose emotions. The whole idea of fear is to get you to come unraveled, man. It's, if, you get, if you get a person loose talking, then the emotions are going to start going. And you look at this in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 14. That night, all the... Now, I am not going to embellish this, but we read it and we fail to understand what they're actually doing, so I'm going to pause. That night... All the members of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. Now, I've seen a lot of news reports, but nothing on TV has ever caused me to do that. But they get the, and they didn't do it at first. These guys keep pumping it, and by the evening, they've got the whole nation crying aloud. They're becoming emotionally unglued. Fear, anxiety. It says, so let me ask you, what do you do when your emotions start to get the best of you? Well, you want to blame somebody, right? Nobody ever says, hey, what's wrong with your problem? Well, I'm just, I'm just having a meltdown. You know what they say? It's because of, right? It, they're not going to own their emotions losing a grip. They're going to blame somebody. So, all the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron. Let's, well anyway. And the whole assembly said to them, if only we had died in Egypt or in this wilderness. Get a grip! You see how they've literally become emotionally a wreck? The fear 
has been has facilitated not only loose talk, now it has facilitated loose emotions. Really? You know, 16 months ago, you guys were crying out to God to get you out of Egypt. And then you were excited because as we left Egypt, they handed us the wealth of Egypt. They were telling us to get out, and they were giving us their gold and all their stuff. And then God has just delivered us from the Red Sea. He parted it. We walked across. You want to go back on all that. So I'm just, I'm just showing you. Fear has a way. It's like a cancer. It just keeps grabbing more of the vital organs. It just won't turn away. And you look at this. Finally, fear facilitates loose spirituality. Loose talk, loose emotions, and you, you're going to end up with some loose spirituality. You say, loose spirituality? Yeah, you'll start, you'll start tinkering with your faith in ways that God never... God was there to give you a firm foundation. Now you start kicking the stones over. And here's what you see. Now notice this. This is verse 3. So I just told you what they said in verse 1 and 2. This is verse 3. Why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Wow, now where, how did we, how did we get, now? so now it's Moses and Aaron's fault, and now, now it's even God's fault. Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? I know sometimes we look at these people and we just think they were holier than thou, and I just wish I could have lived among them. I'll be honest with you, I'm kind of glad I wasn't in that group. I mean, I, I've seen people lose their grip, you know, pers- I, I've never been where a whole group, the entire group lost their grip and was blaming leadership and was blaming God. The very one who's brought them there, and listen, the very one they need, now they've turned on the very one they need, God. They're accusing God of bringing them out there to let them die by the sword. That's what I say, fear will just keep eating away piece by piece, taking your mind, taking your heart, your soul. It'll just keep eating, and it will distort things around you, things that are good for you, you'll think are bad. A God who's there to love you, you'll say he's there to kill you. you, you fear will just take you on a ride that you don't want to go on. And you, in fact, in times past, you would have said, you would have swore, I'll never go there. And there you are today. Number two. Read it out loud. Fear. Wow. Pastor, I disagree with that. Well, then I'll read the Bible, and then you can just take it up with God. Okay. Fear is the root of rebellion. So once fear can get you your spirituality, and begin to loosen it up. Joshua, this is in verses 6 and 7, in verse 9 of Numbers 14. Listen, Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, were among those who had explored the land, tore their clothes, and said to the entire assembly. And I took a little bit of it out, and I'm skipping now to verse 9, because I want you to see the last half of what they had to say. Listen, they tore their clothes because they realized what was going on. Oh, man. You people do not want to go there. Stop. Notice this. Only, hey, why don't you read that phrase with me? Only do not, only do not rebel against the Lord. Their fear has now taken them to the precipice. It will be called rebellion. If you would have said to them, do you have any plans to Rebel against God? Absolutely not. But the enemy knows how to put breadcrumbs. And you chase the breadcrumbs. And by the time you're done chasing those breadcrumbs and you look up, you are where you swore you would never be. He'll track you right into that position. And it goes on. And it says, and do not be afraid of the people of the land because we will devour them. Their protection is gone. But the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. So they're saying, this is more than just you're coming on. Guys, this is turning into rebellion. You're using your fear as an excuse not to obey. 
He said, well, shame on them. Hey, Christians do it all the time. You bring up something in the Word, Bible says we ought to pray. Yeah, well, you know, I've thought about that. And I'm just not quite there. Oh, so you're aware you need to do it. Yeah. You've processed it. Yeah. But you're just not quite there. Right. You know, when my kids tell me that, I call it rebellion. Let me get this right. You knew what I wanted. Yeah. You knew when I wanted it done. Yeah. But you just didn't feel like it right now. Yep. You're grounded. It's amazing the self-talk that we'll give ourselves and think, that works. Does it? At some point, fear becomes rebellion. Even, hey, how many know faith means you go first? For some of you, that was a revelation right now, wasn't it? Faith means, I know what he said, I don't know how this is going to work, but I trust him. Faith means I go first. Number three, read it out loud. Faith leads to, yeah, I'm going to make you read it. Say it again. Fear leads, fear leads to unhealthy assessments of others. So, like I said, fear has a way of lashing out at people and wanting to do things to people that should not have it done to them. But because we're afraid, even when they try to present them, we'll be, we're scared, so we're just going to lash out. Fear, because of loose emotions, can cause us to take expression towards people who are there to bless us and help us, but the fear makes us distort who they are, and we turn on them. We said this earlier. In verse 14, verse 4, And they said to each other, We should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Now, there's a brilliant idea. So let me get this right. We, we griped about this for generations. 400 years. And God got us out of it. And now we're at this precipice. We just defeated the biggest world power that is presently on earth. We just beat them. And we don't have confidence only because these folks have a little more height. And plan B, we were wondering when you guys were going to get around to, we can't win, what plan B was. Plan B is, let's go back to Egypt where they used to beat us. Now there's a vision. Boy, I'll tell you what, that's something I can buy into. Now look at this. In the story, it says that Joshua and Caleb stood up to the people, and they gave that speech, and we read a little bit of it. He, they said, do not rebel against the Lord, blah, 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 please don't do this. Look at what they did to Joshua and Caleb. But the whole assembly talked about stoning them. Their idea is to stone to death the people who say, I think we ought to follow God. And their concept is, we don't like what you have to say. We're going to kill you if you don't shut up. You see how fear just... That morning, Moses, Aaron, Joshua, Caleb, stellar leaders, everybody loved them. By the time the sun sets, they've literally turned into a mob because of fear. Fear. And they didn't like somebody telling them what was possible with God. So, hey, since we can't get rid of God, let's get rid of his messengers. Fear leads to unhealthy assessments of others. You'll accuse them of things that they're not. You'll say things about them that's not true. But you're so desperate to get your point, you'll embellish. Because it's important for, listen to me, it's important that you win. <laughs> That's the, it's not be right. It's important that you win. And you know, can I, let me just say this. We're supposed to be on the side of truth, even if that means I get corrected. Even if I 
because of truth, I get corrected, then I get corrected. So be it. Truth is more important than my win-loss column. All right. Number four. This is going so well, I'm going to go up to point 20. <laughs> I can just tell this is really resonating, you know. But hey, how many know the word sometimes tells us tough stuff? Okay. So read number four. Fear sabotages. It can cost us our future. You look at verses 20 through 23. This is Now I want you to notice what God says because it sometimes runs against some people's theology. They think because forgiveness means I get everything back. No, or sometimes you make choices. You can be forgiven, but you still lose, this, you know, you've lost things. And hopefully from that point on, you can move forward and begin to rebuild your life. But he's, it's, So Moses, so anyway, God says, that's it. I'm wiping them out. And Moses makes a great case. He turns into a Lord. God, you can't do that because if you wipe these people out at this particular point, then all the nations are going to say their God is, you know, he doesn't back his people. God, you can't do that. You've got to stand by. You're right. I agree with Hey, God, they're wanting to kill me. But I'm just telling you, you can't do that. God, give him a break. Give him, give him a chance. And God says, all right. So this is God's answer. The Lord replied, I have forgiven them as you asked. Now, how many know you would just love to stop right there and let's just move on and go home? But look at this. Nevertheless, as surely as I live and as surely as the glory of the Lord fills the whole earth, not one of those who saw my glory in the signs I performed in Egypt and in the wilderness but who disobeyed me and tested me ten times. Wow, God's keeping score. Ten times in 16 months. Not one of them will ever see the land. Are they forgiven? But God says, I've taken the reward. Don't act like God's being mean and nasty because as a parent, you know what that's like. I'm glad you're sorry, but I'm still taking your car. I'm glad you're sorry, but you're still grounded. Oh, come on. Your children tell us. <laughs> anyway. Okay, here we go. So not one of them will ever say, I promise the no to their ancestors. No one who has treated me with contempt will ever see it. God says you're forgiven, but you just lost your future. Wow. So what we learn here is this. Fear can ruin my future, but by the time I come around, I've sabotaged it. And I'm going to have to look for, listen, a different kind of future. I will not be able to have the future that I could have had if I not sabotaged it. But because I sabotaged it, I can still have a future. It's just going to be a different one now. Is everybody with me? If you've talked to anybody who's been convicted, of a, of a crime or a felon, you'll understand that. Some of them, have, that has been a wake-up call, and they've made their lives right with God. And man, when they served their time, they came out, they've got jobs, they've got families, and they say, man, I ain't never going back to that stuff ever, ever again. But did you know what? It's still on their record. And some of them still have to report to a probation officer. And they'll acknowledge, God gave me a second chance. Yeah, he absolutely did. But you know what? I sabotaged my future. I lost a lot of chances and abilities that would have been available to me by some poor choices and decisions. And I've paid my debt to society. But you know what? I don't have the options that I used to have. But boy, am I glad that at least Jesus gave me some. Y'all with me? Okay. So we need to understand that from the perspective that God forgives. Everybody say, God forgives. But my sin can change my future. That's what helps us to be wiser in today's choices and wiser in tomorrow's decisions and choices. Here's the last point. I got to send you out with good news. Because right now you're probably thinking, wow, I can only imagine what next week is. <laughs> Read it out loud. God's presence changes everything. As I wrap this up, and I'm going to ask you musicians to make their way if they would. 
They're talking about stoning Joshua and Caleb. They're talking about replacing Moses and Aaron. Let's do a U-turn and we're headed back to Egypt. Now, how do you, listen, how do you stop that? How do you stop that kind of momentum? Negative. How do you, how do you get two to three million people who are gripped by fear and get them to hit the pause button? Much less, how do we get them to pivot? I'll tell you how. God shows up. Notice chapter 14, verse 10. This is after all these incidences, and Joshua and Caleb have made this strong appeal, don't go there, don't rebel. And it says, they talked about stoning them. And in verse 10, but the whole assembly talked about stoning him. Then, how many, I want more thens in life than, but there was, I don't want those. I want thens. Then the glory of the Lord appeared at the tent of meeting to all the Israelites. They talked about God bringing them out to let them die. And God decided to show up. And it's from here on out that it's a dialogue between Moses and God. This is the pivot in the story. This is where the pivot happens with Moses, God saying, that's it, they're done, they're going to get wiped out. You know, Moses, you can't do that. And then God says, all right, I'll let them live, but they're taking a walk, but none of them are going to see the promised land. You go on through the story in chapter 14, here's how it plays out. Moses told them, God's not going to let you see the promised land. It's going to be the next generation. And the people weep because they now recognize what's happened. The very thing that they had lived for has now been taken from them. And they rally against the wishes of Moses and Joshua. And they decide to go into the land and try to fight anyway. And now it becomes, so all of a sudden now this fear turns into faith and it's too late. And Moses says, what are you doing? They said, we're, we're going to go in there. We're going to do it now. And he's like, you can't do that can't do that and it says they did and they were defeated soundly and I say that God's presence changes everything it spins the story on its head there were a group of disciples inside of a room with every door closed and every window shut and they were scared to death because their leader had been killed because now they thought they were wanted men. And through the wall, Jesus comes. And he changed that little hideaway into a Bible study by just coming in. And he addressed Thomas and some of the others just by showing up. Jesus changed a funeral into a resurrection by just showing up. Jesus took inadequate supplies, food, bread, prayed over, blessed it, said feed, and it went and fed 5,000 people. I'm here to tell you, God's presence always changes everything. It just, that's, let me tell you this. We are people of presence. We don't just talk about God. We believe he shows up when we gather and when we talk, that he's in our midst and when we pray for each other. We believe God. Jesus shows up because if he doesn't let me tell you we're just another social group gathering everybody with me his presence changes everything and the next time he shows up in the clouds trust me there's a lot of stuff that's gonna change every time he shows up something gives it's just who he is so let me just tell you this. You got fear? Let Jesus show up. I promise that fear will go. You got illness and disease and sickness and challenges in your life? I'm here to tell you, Jesus shows up. It's over just like that. It's resolved. All the You got animosity and hatred in your heart and in your life? I'm telling you, he'll touch your life. He'll replace it with life. His presence will change you like you've never been changed before. You don't think you have a future? You don't think you have a hope? 
you don't think that, listen, ask Jesus into your heart and watch your life start to change. Let me tell you this. If I didn't believe that, I would not be doing what I'm doing. If I don't believe that, I'm moving on to something else. But that's what keeps me coming back. His presence can change your life. And everybody said amen. Come on, let's everybody stand if you would. Come on, all over this place. Lift your hands. I want you to praise him for his presence. I want you to praise him for his anointing. Come on, church, let's all lift our voice. 30 seconds. Come on, lift it right now in Jesus' name. And with everybody's head bowed this evening, I'm going to ask that no one look around. But you'd say, hey, pastor, I need to accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And I would like to do that tonight. You know, I don't want to do this in a way that makes it difficult or brings unwanted attention. But I would be willing to lead this entire congregation in a prayer. If there were those who said, I want to accept Christ. And if that's you, what I'm going to ask you to do is just to simply, in just a second, to lift your hand. When you do that, I'm going to say, I see your hand. I'm going to say it in a general way. I'm not going to say who you are or where you're seated or anything like that. I'm just going to say, I see your hand. And if anybody lifts their hand, then I'm going to lead this entire congregation in a prayer. And they're going to say it with you just to encourage you. So you say, hey, I'm going to be asking Christ into my life. Can I see your hand today? Anywhere across this building. That hand says you're going to be accepting Christ anywhere. Then the second thing is this. I know that we have so many protocols that we have to honor. But let me ask you this. How many of you are facing something that you could use the presence of Jesus to help you face that challenge, face that giant in your life? Can I see your hand? Come on. Here's what I'm going to do. Hold it. I'm going to ask you to leave it up. Would you do that? Leave it up. I'm going to ask everybody else. Would you just turn around? And if you see a hand, I just want you to turn towards them and extend your hand. I know you can't go over there, okay? But would you turn towards somebody and would you pray for them from the distance? You see their hand up, you know what it is? Pray, come on. I'm gonna ask us to do that for like 90 seconds. Come on, everybody pray out loud. Come on, lift your voices now, come on. Listen, I'm going to say the blessing, and then they're going to sing and dismiss us, beginning in the back row, moving forward. So if you would wait till they get to your row before you uh, dismiss, we'd appreciate it. And we'll be singing, but come on, lift your hands as I say the blessing, and we begin to dismiss this evening. I bless you in the name of the Lord. May he bless you in this city and in this county. May the fruit of your womb and the crops of your land and all your livestock be blessed. May he bless the work of your hands at home, at work, at church, in this community. May he bless your coming and your going. May the Lord grant the enemies that are rising up against you be defeated. When they come at you in one direction, let them flee from you in seven directions. May the Lord send a blessing on everything that you put your hand to do. May he continue to establish you as his holy people. May all people see that you have been called by the name of the Lord. May the Lord grant you prosperity, opening up the heavens, the storehouse of his bounty. May he bless the work of your hands. I bless you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And everybody gave a shout of amen. Come on now, let's sing it now as they come and dismiss us.